Welcome to episode 20 of the Energy Balance Podcast. I'm Jay Feldman, and joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. For those of you who don't know, Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition and researching together for the past six years or so, and now we're working together through this podcast to help people recover their health, to get their health back, get their energy back, and we do that through a bioenergetic view of health. And if you're new to the podcast, I would highly recommend going back and checking out the first eight to 10 episodes or so where we really dive into what that bioenergetic view is and a lot of the primary principles that are really important for governing our health. So as far as today's episode, we are going to be talking about going all in and intuitive eating, which are basically ways of eating that have come about in response to the diet culture and the chronic dieting and extreme hunger that so many people are experiencing throughout the health and fitness industries. And basically, all in and intuitive eating are meant to be an antidote to all of the various symptoms that people experience from chronic dieting, which again, this includes extreme hunger. It also includes hormonal issues and a lack of energy and poor sleep and poor gut health and all sorts of other symptoms that people experience from chronic dieting or yo-yo dieting. And so we'll be talking on today's episode about these approaches, the intuitive eating and going all in and whether they work, what the drawbacks are to these approaches and how we can apply similar principles to these approaches and achieve the same benefits without some of these drawbacks. We'll also be talking about how you can turn off excessive or extreme hunger or even our regular hunger signals by understanding how our hunger signals work. And we'll also be talking about how we can determine how much food we should be eating for optimal health and for weight loss. To check out the show notes for today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where I'll be linking to any of these studies or articles or anything else that we reference throughout today's episode. And if you are dealing with any of those symptoms as a result of chronic dieting or yo-yo dieting or anything else that you've done to try to improve your health, if you are experiencing a lot of cravings and hunger, if you're experiencing hormonal imbalances, whether that's a lack of libido or infertility or amenorrhea for women, or if you're experiencing fatigue, a lack of energy, if you're not sleeping well, whether that's not being able to fall asleep or stay asleep, or maybe you have gut issues, you've got a lot of bloating or constipation, if you are experiencing any of those things, then I would highly recommend you head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy, where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll walk you through the main things that you want to do to support energy production and the things that you want to avoid that inhibit that process. And I'll also explain why this is so fundamental for improving our health and how a lack of energy underlies virtually all of these symptoms that people experience all the time. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And I did want to mention also before we get started that due to some technical difficulties, Mike was without his microphone for today's episode. So I'm sorry about the lower audio quality than usual, but bear with us, please. And I also wanted to say that considering that this is episode 20, or really it's episode 21 because we had an episode zero, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say a huge thank you and just express how grateful I am for all of the support for the podcast. It's really been so overwhelming. All of the reviews and likes and comments and all of the feedback I've been getting from people who have been implementing principles and recommendations that we've given throughout this uh, throughout this podcast and how much they've benefited from the uh, the things that we've been talking about and how much it's really changed the way they see their health. And yeah, it's just so, it's really so great to hear all those things. So again, I just want to say thank you guys so much for all the support. And with that, let's get started. Let's start by defining all in and, and intuitive eating, where basically intuitive eating is the idea that we are, that somebody is shedding the restrictions on what they're eating. And rather than eating based on a certain calorie amount that they've, that is pre-decided or, you know, getting a certain amount of carbohydrates or fat or protein, they are instead eating based on their own hunger signals to allow them to determine how much they should eat and 
also what they should eat as far as kind of hunger and cravings go. And more recently, there's been this idea of, of going all in, which is basically like a step towards intuitive eating or a, a, an entryway into it, where especially for someone who has been on extreme in extreme diets, going through extreme dieting, uh, they it's basically a period of, of not having any restriction at all, where you just eat whatever you want, however much you want, whenever you want with the goal of getting to a point where your hunger signals are restored, you kind of find that find what, what supposedly is a nat- natural set point, and you are able to intuitively eat without problem. And the main person who has popularized this idea of, of all in is Stephanie Buttermore, and she's kind of documented her journey with it over the past year, where she went from a, peer, uh, a bikini model and, and competitor to, uh, to basically 42 pounds. Right, right. Yeah. So she was incredibly lean, very popular YouTuber. And she had a lot of symptoms from all of her extreme dieting. She was cold all the time. She dealt with extreme hunger. She was basically always starving. Uh, She met she had some hormonal issues. She was she had amenorrhea for a period of time, meaning she didn't have her menstrual cycle, her period. And she mentioned a few other symptoms as well, just energy and and fatigue, a lack of energy and, and having fatigue. And those things are really common for somebody who is dieting in a really restrictive way. So is brain fog and, and having trouble sleeping, insomnia. Those are all pretty common. And so she was experiencing things like that, decided to go all in to to fix these things and then documented her journey. And just a very broad recap is that she, she ate a ton of food throughout it, especially in the beginning, she was eating a ton. Over time, her hunger signal, her hunger did decrease, her appetite decreased and she ate less and less. So she started out at about 5,000 calories a day, ended up around 2,800 calories a day. She gained a lot of weight in the process, uh, over 40 pounds, as as you had said, Mike. And she actually ended up about 13 pounds down from, at least after a year, she's 13 pounds down from her highest weight. So, uh, and that was all natural. She hasn't been restricting at all. It's just kind of through this intuitive type of eating. And yeah, so she documented her journey, experienced various things along the way that we'll, we'll kind of touch on, but that's kind of the introduction to all in and intuitive eating and why we're talking about it. And, and basically we think that, or I'll, I'll start with me. Like, I, I think that there are a lot of benefits to intuitive eating and to all in that, especially when compared to the extreme restrictive dieting that's out there and the, the cutting and bulking cycles in the fitness industry. But for most people, it's just the yo-yo dieting or just constant dieting. And so I do think that this is a step in, in the right direction for sure, but also that there are some problems within it, some areas that are not considered or acknowledged and some ways that it can be improved, which is essentially the way that we would suggest somebody eats. So, yeah, yeah I, would, I mean, I think that there's a, so there's a lot of different ideas floating around right now and all the nutrition communities about what is, you know, what is the best way to, for health or to lose weight or to bulk up. And then you already mentioned you have cutting and bulking with bodybuilding and compet and physique comp- uh, competitions. Um, and then you have the general mainstream approach, which is portion control. And then you have extensions of portion control, which and caloric, uh, caloric intake and caloric excesses and things like that, which goes into intermittent fasting and fasting in general. Um, and then after that, you go into um, you go into more approaches that look at okay, well, what types of foods are you eating? And then from there, you have things like the Mediterranean diet, all the way to paleo diet, eating it, eating, and you have macronutrient uh, breakdowns and things like that. So there's a lot of different camps or theories on the best way to eat or the best way to get a certain effect. Um, and I think in our camp or the camp that at least that I would say is makes the most sense would be something along the lines of, you know, eating to what your satiety cues are. So eating as much as you're hungry for and fulfilling your cravings for salt and sugar and fat and things like that. But choosing which specific foods you think are going to be the most beneficial based on physiology and research and things like that. So there's a, there's an all in component in or not an all in, but there's an intuitive component Mm -hmm. to what we talk about or what I specifically recommend. But I do think that you can't, I don't think that all in per se is a good idea. I think that there needs to be a degree of restriction, 
especially considering our modern environment and what foods are available and things like that. So, and we can, when you look at, when you go through some, some of Stephanie's journey and things like that, um, when she first started, she did whole foods and she said that she was very bloated. She couldn't eat that much and things like that. And, and it really depends on, she's saying she's eating a lot of beans and oats and heavy starches and things like that. And, um, yeah, that will, if you eat a lot of that, you probably will get bloated. Um, and then eventually she moved more towards junk food. And when she moved in towards her junk food phase, she gained a lot of water weight. Um, she was very bloated. She was having swelling. She was having um, probably hormonal dysregulation when she talks about all her breakdowns and emotional things that occurred. I'm sure the journey in itself was an emotional and the, the negative comments and things like that. But I also wouldn't put it past to have um, emotional issues from hormonal stuff going on with eating whatever you want. So overall, I think that the idea of intuitive eating makes a lot of sense. And I think that it's beneficial, but I don't think that all in is a good idea. Um, I, I don't think that it really makes any sense, the all in aspect. Um, and then from there, I, I think that it's really important to choose what foods you're eating and have restriction about what foods you're eating. Um, and I think that those, those would be the, my point of view or caveat from her situation. And I think a lot of her issues could have been individually avoided by choosing specific foods instead of going and eating burgers and fries and pizza and, and donuts and whatever else. Yeah. I don't think that this, I don't think that those foods give normal satiety cues. And I don't think that they, I think that they can induce cravings more so than help cravings. And I think it's important to rather than just eat everything that you can eat altogether to figure out what foods work for you and what foods are doing well by you instead of just, oh, the kitchen sink approach is I'm just going to eat every single thing. Right. So, yeah. So th there's like a, a few things I want to break down there. So first off, when you say restriction, we don't necessarily mean restricting how you're eating. And we'll talk through this, but but there's actually a lot of value to eating as much as you want to eat within certain guidelines. And part of that has to do with eating certain foods and not others. So it's more of a restriction of the types of foods than the amounts. Although there's... um circumstances where you might want to restrict the amount as well and we'll talk about that too but it's not based on this idea that the only way to lose weight is just to eat less we actually both think that eating a lot more is is really helpful and can result in weight loss if it's done properly it's not a calories in calories out approach exactly right but by the same token yeah there's the, the type of foods matter and so we'll talk about that the the other thing that i want to point out before we talk about some of the like why it works and because it does work to an extent right she gained a lot of weight and then started losing some of it entirely without restriction and there's something to be said for that and there's reasons for that so i want to touch on that but the um, the i guess let's start there so the well, what was her initial goals her initial goals were to she had extreme hunger she had cold extremities and I think she was just always cold and she was having hormonal issues. And so she wanted to resolve those three things. I think the main one that she had said she was focusing on was the hunger side. Okay. Just feeling always very, very restricted, starving, essentially. And so she solved, according to her, she solved the hunger issue. But we don't know about the other two. Right. And there's there's something to be said for that. And what I was kind of going to get at is is that because of our diet culture, our relationship, many people's relationship with food is so skewed that there are certain instances where I think all in might be the best approach for somebody who cannot deal with anything in the middle between extreme restriction and no restriction at all. If they can't just change certain types of foods that they're eating and slowly increase them and slowly bring in the right types of foods and make small adjustments step by step, which is kind of what we'll, what we would suggest with certain guidelines. If they can't do that because of how of like the psychological component in the relationship with food, then there might be a place for something like all in for that person. But of course, in talking about the psychological component, it wasn't easy for Stephanie. And the reason for that is, be is because she gained a lot of weight. And also there's a hormonal component too, probably that, that you had mentioned, you had alluded to. So it's not like it's necessarily psychologically easier to go all in either, but it might be easier to take the first step. So those are important things to consider, but it, the the general idea there is sound uh, like there is sound physiology underlying the idea of 
when you're restrictive dieting and you're eating very little, it does suppress your metabolism. And when we're in that state of a suppressed metabolism, basically our body is trying to conserve as much energy as possible so that it can survive. So if you consider an event where we don't have food available, if we want to survive until there is food available, we have to conserve as much energy as possible. And so that's basically what happens within our bodies where we downregulate all of our higher level functions, our higher level brain functions, our immune function, our reproductive function, our digestive functions. And we just, our bodies just focus on basically survival. And that does happen when we eat very little. And when we eat a lot more, the opposite will happen too. Like those things will start to come back in many ways. And but, what, what are some specific symptoms before you continue of what would be down-regulated functions? Cause you talk about like higher order functions you down-regulate, but what symptoms could you expect? Like for example, with Stephanie. Yeah. So she talked about being cold all the time, which body temperatures is a big component here. So that would be one. She also talked about hormonal issues. So uh, our reproduction is not of utmost importance to our individual survival at a period of time. So that's something that gets downregulated, which means infertility potentially. It can mean amenorrhea, which she had experienced for a period of time on her extreme dieting. It which can is also lack of a period. Right. Yeah, a, a lack of libido is another component there as far as the reproductive side goes that um, that plays a role. And then those reproductive hormones also play roles in other aspects of our health, our, our mental function and our energy and um, even digestion, immune function. So uh, body mass in as far as muscle mass goes. So there's, a, there's definitely some important things to consider on the reproductive side. As far as the brain side goes, um, brain fog is, is something that people experience, which is basically just kind of like a cloudiness in your thinking and an inability to think critically about things or to think for a long period of time or to really focus on something. Uh, it can also include becoming really irritable and um, for some people like losing a sense of humor. Speaking of all of this, it, it also, there, there's a study talking about, there, there's a, a very well referenced or very famous study called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment, where they basically put um, men, we've talked about this in the past, so I'll just skim over it, but they yeah. basically put men on a, essentially a semi-starvation diet going from 3,300 calories to 1,800 calories. And they experience all of these things and which many fitness competitors go lower than and like drop body fat to lower percentages and things like that as well. So like way below starvation level diets. Right. And these men were between 150 and 160 pounds relatively lean. So they were not large guys who were on this huge 3,300 calorie day diet. That was just normal for, for them. And which also just goes to show how much dieting culture and the terrible food uh, supply that we have has contributed to lowered metabolisms and yeah. eating so much less when we consider that, that what was it, 70, 80 years ago, people were, you know, somebody who was between 150 and 160 pounds was eating 3,300 calories a day and maintaining their weight as a very lean guy. So yeah. Yeah. And now the recommendation is 2000 calories and or 2,500. Yeah. Or we routine, I routinely see people, at much higher weights than 160 pounds eating less than 2000 calories. Right. So, and people making remarks about people being fat because of gluttony and things like that. When in reality, a lot of obese people that I know are eating significantly under amount of calories required for their, their maintenance of their body weight, yet still gaining weight. Right. And I think that, I think that with that example, it's important. And with Stephanie's example, it's important to talk about that from the, from the idea of, or what the research term is, is the set point, the metabolic set point. And so what this is essentially what you were just talking about, but it's, and, but specifically when you lower your, when you're dieting down or you're, you're, um, de decrease the calories to lose weight, your body down regulates its metabolism. You have all the effects that you just talked about, but then it also gets to a point where you can now maintain your body weight at less calories and calories right. being just a standard, um, arbitrary, unit to determine food quantity mm -hmm. so you have so with stephanie she can get down to 1000 calories and she's maintaining her body weight on that because she's dieted down and her metabolism has slowed to reach those requirements now her the side effects from there where she didn't have her period the cold hand and cold feet sound like thyroid issues to me um like very general thyroid issues and then you know whatever other symptoms the extreme hunger that was going on um so in this case the, the, the basic, the way to fix that is basically a reverse diet, which is essentially what she did was a reverse diet. 
And a reverse diet is essentially adding in calories so that you can increase your metabolic rate on a, on a regular basis, get it back up to a higher um, set point per se. Um, and her choice of doing this was all in. Now, what is the other option that you can do if you have that, that down low? You, could, you can gradually increase your calories. You right. don't have to slam 5,000 calories from 2,000 calories. Well, right. So, but, but before we get there, I just want, cause I want to recap this whole relationship between how much we eat and metabolism. Cause it kind of underlies why we don't want to just jump into eating 5,000 calories a day from yeah. 1,000. Mm -hmm. So when we are in this low metabolic state and we have our reproductive function depressed, you mentioned thyroid function, which is the kind of governor of our metabolism. That is one of the first things to downregulate when we don't have enough food available. And then you also uh, below that, like other things that are governed by those those higher level hormones. We mentioned brain function, immune function is another one, so people will get sick very often or potentially. Um, and then it also affects a lot of other symptoms like sleep and insomnia, and skin issues can come up. Brittle hair, skin, and nails is a common one. Just just a very general degradation of of health happens when we don't have enough food, which is not surprising. I mean, of course, in starvation, people's health degrades. It's, it, it makes sense, but we just don't think about it in those terms when we're talking about diets. So that definitely that is something that has been shown to happen when we don't eat enough. And it's not just a matter of how much food we're taking in, but whether we're actually converting that food to energy. And that's that, that's such an important component. I think the biggest component that's missed when it comes to this all in idea, which is that all calories are just equal. So if you were eating too little, the only way to bring your metabolism back up is just to eat more. And in reality, it's, it's more nuanced than that. There's, there are a lot of factors that affect whether we actually convert the food that we're taking into energy. And that's the, that energy is actually the determinant of where our metabolism is going to be, because we can eat 3000 calories of food, or we can eat a thousand calories of food and end up with the same amount of energy, depending on what we're eating and what's going on internally. And that situation is not very likely. Normally what's going to happen, which is what happened with Stephanie is that if you eat way more, you're going to end up with more energy, but it's kind of like having a really inefficient engine. So when you had that inefficient engine and you took in a little bit of fuel, it was able to convert that fuel to energy. If you want more energy, you just have to dump in a ton of fuel and you end up with a ton of waste. And at this point, waste that isn't converted to energy and in this case that supposed the waste which isn't exactly how it happens but that waste is then just stored as body fat so stephanie was taking in this huge amount of fuel of this five five thousand calories at first and converting more energy converting more of it to energy than she was prior so she ended up with more energy than before which is why her hunger started to go down but it also came at the cost of putting on a ton of body fat and so that's kind of what we're going to get at is that if we improve the efficiency of converting the food to energy. And part of that is, is changing the types of foods. Part of it is how quickly we increase the foods that will allow us to get to that same point of not feeling restricted, being able to eat intuitively, but without the other symptoms that have come along with her journey or with many other people's journey, including a ton of weight gain, weight gain, bloating, emotional dysregulation, hormonal dysregulation, leading to Possibly leading to things that, like she mentioned, as a vein ablation procedure, mm -hmm. um, menstrual yeah. irregularities, where she talked about her, she had to get her, her copper IUD removed because it was getting very painful. I don't know if maybe the copper IUD, when it was put in and when the symptoms developed, it wasn't very clear. Um, but just a, a, at her age, having this extreme swelling at your ankles is a energy, is a, like a severe energy dysregulation. Mm -hmm. Usually you see swelling at the ankles in older people with heart disease um, or any type or liver disease or any type of edematous process. So the other thing I want to talk about here in, in relationship to just increasing your calories to 5,000 is that when you go from 1,000 to 5,000, if you're at 1,000, your digestive processes aren't going to be able to handle a massive increase in calories like that. Mm -hmm. Most likely, maybe some people will, you know, I'm not going to say for everyone, but for some, but for most likely not, especially if you're going to, depending on what food you're eating. So a lot of food will go straight to the, to the undigested, to the colon, especially if you're eating massive amounts. And then you can basically get, um, you can get a lot of bacterial overgrowth and things like that in the colon, maybe in the small intestine, depends on what happens in your own situation. Um, depending on the foods and the quantity of food, 
And then that can cause weight gain and that can cause bloating and that can cause metabolic dysregulation and things like that. So I think it's important to number one, choose specifically which foods you're going to eat. And rather than jump all in to maybe gradually taper up the amount of calories you're eating on a slow basis so that you can adapt to eating that number of calories again. And then another thing that I think is important. And I think that as much as, because as far as I understood her, she wanted to get rid of her massive hunger, but she also wanted to get out of the restrictive mindset of eating. Yeah. And the thing is, is I'm not, there's a degree to which a restrictive mindset of eating is pathologic. I'm I a hundred percent on board with that, but at some extent, not having a restrictive eating to mind to not having a restrictive mindset to eating may also be pathologic. I think there needs to be a degree of restriction. And I think that's, that's important. And I think that moving and, and it really depends on where you're coming from. You know, if you're coming from super restrictive, I don't know if going all in is a good idea. It, it really is going to have to depend on the person, but coming more towards a middle ground where it's like, I'm going to eat until I'm hungry. And I'm going to eat the certain foods that I know I, that are good for me, that are okay for me, that, that I feel well with, that I don't get these issues with especially if you're at that very down regulated metabolic spot where you're existing on a thousand calories a day, because all your, all your functions are down regulated. You're going to have bloating. You're going to have digestive issues. You're going to, so it's important to get over that hump and to some extent. Um, but going out and just saying, I'm going to go all in and I'm going to eat Krispy Kreme donuts. And like when these people do 10,000 calorie or 5,000 calorie day challenges, I'm going to go to Domino's and get a pizza and whatever. Like, I don't think that that's healthy and I don't think that there's any benefit to doing that. I don't think that that helps your metabolism in right. any way. I think if anything that hinders your metabolism and causes problem, more problems in the long run than in the short run. So I think a healthy balance is necessary. I think being too restrictive obviously has its detriments, but I also think not being restrictive enough also has its detriments. And there has to be a degree of, especially because with what foods are available now, you know, it come from our digestive abilities and from our, um, from our background, metabolic abilities and things that we can handle down eating a bunch of vegetable oils, is not a good idea, especially cooked at high temperatures, right? Or is eating copious amounts of candy with silicon dioxide and dyes and things like that, or going to a restaurant and eating, I don't know, soy burgers or things like that. None of those things are on the menu and none of those things jive with our physiology. So I think it's really important to choose your foods appropriately. And for somebody who's coming from that fragile state, I think it's even more important to choose your foods appropriately because I think digestion at that point is going to be impaired. And I think that that's something that we noticed when we, when we came out of our own um, restricted eating phases of intermittent fasting and keto diets and lowering calories and things like that to get lean. When we came out, we had that extreme hunger for a period of time and we were eating upwards of six, 7,000 calories a day and having issues, digestive issues and things like that, doing stuff like that. And it was only, you know, through going through that process that you figure out that, well, maybe certain foods aren't jiving with you and, and you do, you do need carbs, you need fat, you do need proteins, but which ones are going to work for you? Yeah. And there, I mean, there are principles there. It's not, it's not just all individual. And so we'll we'll talk through that. Based on the principles that we've talked about in all the other podcasts and things like that. Right. But I just, I really want to hammer home the point that it's in, that the idea of all in, I think is, is not, not necessarily a good thing. And I think intuitive eating is a good thing, but I think, I really think that you have to watch what you're eating with the all in approach. I don't think that going all in on Krispy Kreme is a good idea. I, I, I would argue that it's still the all in intuitive eating, like, which are kind of the same all in is just kind of like a transition towards it. It seems I would say that that's still better than the yo-yo dieting for your whole life when like, especially metabolically. I mean, normally the people who end up dieting for their whole lives end up with more like way more overweight. They never reach that point where their appetite just starts to go down and, and um, they, they end up in, in that kind of happy medium place. They also are surviving with much less energy the whole time. So even though they might be leaner potentially, they're going to end up with much less energy. And I think that that is a greater cost than excess body fat. And um, by the I'm not actually. worried about the body fat per se. I'm more worried about metabolic issues for some of those things. The, the body fat, as you were saying, is not the concern. The concern is what's leading to it, as you said. And so yeah, if, if you're overeating poofa and, and 
a bunch of fibers and things like that, I think that that may be worse than not eating enough carbs or whatever in the long run for some people. Right. But the, the issue is, is again, I, it, I would say it all comes down to energy. And so the issue is when people are gaining weight, what that means is a decent amount of the food that they're taking in is being converted towards stored as body fat, being stored as body fat, which means that it's not being converted to energy. So typically that is a sign that metabolism is lower, energy production is lower, but not necessarily. It could still be a sign of an increase, for example, in the case of somebody who is going towards intuitive, or intuitive eating or all in, where they are noticing that, yes, they're gaining body fat, but they're also ending up with more energy than prior because uh, because some amount of, of some increase in the amount of food that they're taking in is being converted to energy. So, yeah, and and like, there's no, of course, there's no like clear cut uh, research here but or anything like I that. I don't think that there's an answer for which one's worse than the other. Sure. And I think most research would point towards caloric restriction being better than caloric excess, especially in diets comparing the standard American diet, which is probably what most people are eating, to. If you're going to go on an Atkins diet, or you're going to go yeah. on a Mediterranean diet with portion control, or if you're going to do the caloric restriction longevity diets and things like that, they would say that it's better by all these. That's why I'm saying it's kind of like the caloric restriction is not good. And I'm, I don't think that being chronically caloric restricted is a helpful way to live. If it does improve in the number of years that you live, okay, fine, but you don't feel good. <laughs> so like, what right. do you want? At least, at least in my experience with that. Right. But then on the other end, a lot of people eating a lot of food in the standard American diet, I don't think is good either. And I don't, I think it's hard to say which one's worse. You're either yeah. eating as much as you want, all, as you're eating as much food as you want in general or whatever food you want in general. And you're putting on a lot of weight and you're getting metabolic syndrome, which is what people tend to have happen. Or you're chronically restricting and you don't feel good at all, but you don't have metabolic syndrome because you <laughs> couldn't even develop metabolic syndrome from that perspective. Yeah, but I most people. Whole, I think both are on opposite ends of the spectrum and just aren't good. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there, are, there are, there's also a lot of issues with the caloric restriction research. Uh, I've, I've got articles on course, that. So yeah. I'll reference I'm not those. saying there isn't, but I'm saying if people were going to make an argument against what people could make an argument against that the caloric restriction, chronic dieting is worse, is worse than the caloric expense. And then they're going to point to lowered lipids on caloric restriction and, and better cholesterol profiles and the longevity in monkeys and rats and things like that. But basically right, but what I'm saying is I don't think one is worse than the other. I think they both have their problems. And I think that the point here is that we're not saying to caloric restrict and we're not saying to go all in and eat whatever you want all the time in terms of standard American diet fare, Krispy Kreme, McDonald's, quick check sandwiches, public sandwiches, whatever it is. It's sort of we're going to find a happy medium of you need to eat as much as you want in terms of protein, carbs, fats, and specific types of foods. Um, but the, the point is, is that it needs to be within specific principles of diet and types of foods. It doesn't, you don't need to do that. That would just be the, what the recommendation is. Yeah, I, I agree. Neither of them are ideal. The I, I think it's important to point out that the two things, or three things, I guess. One is that Again, a lot of the caloric restriction research, like I know people would point to it. There's a lot of flaws with it that I, to the point that I don't think is all that relevant. I would, I think it's also important to consider that intuitive eating doesn't mean necessarily caloric excess. The idea is that there's a temporary period of caloric excess, especially with something like all in where you're kind of, the idea with all in is you're kind of speeding that process up and you're getting to a point where you're not in that same quote caloric excess and your appetite is more normalized and you're eating a typical amount. So you're not in that extremely excessive eating phase which is what they're normally comparing caloric restriction to and saying this is so much worse than caloric yeah, restriction I would, I would studies yeah right exactly so 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 i think that's important to consider the other thing as well is that i don't think most people eating a standard american diet which you had mentioned like obviously are not healthy most of them are also still dieting just eating bad foods like most of them are still living through a restriction mindset and are still trying to diet again, not all, not uh, typically not the ones who are naturally lean, but most people who are on the standard American diet are not all that lean. And even if they're only a little bit overweight, there is still that restriction mindset there where they're maybe stick, skipping breakfast and eating some pizza for lunch, but they're still intentionally trying to skip breakfast because they ate too much the night before, or they're, they still kind of want to lose weight, but they also don't want to have to not eat pizza. So I still think that the restriction is so ubiquitous throughout 
our culture that it's it's hard to make a comparison that we know the standard american diet is bad so because of that we know that restriction is and 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 that we know that those people are obviously eating as much as they want so we know that restriction is better and again there's no clear-cut answer here between is it better to restrict or is it better to to quote unquote over I don't think there I don't think you can say one is worse than that. Right, that's what I'm saying is there's definitely no clear cut answer because so much of it is individualized between some somebody's individual experience intuitive eating and what where that takes them versus any individual experience with restrictive eating which there's so much variation between different calorically restrictive diets and lives lives. I also think for standard American restrictive is probably one of the worst places to be with bull. You're restricting calories and the calories that you're eating are crap. I think that that's a very bad combination to be entertaining. The, my ish, so my issue with the all-in versus... So I have an issue more with all-in versus intuitive eating. So intuitive okay. eating for me in, is the sense that you're going to have as you're eating to satiety and you're following your hunger cues. If you want something salty, you have something salty. If you want craving something sweet, you have something sweet. If you're hungry, you eat something. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me. If you're craving some pro, something yeah. like like a steak or something, you eat the steak. I think that that's great. I think that people should be following that. I think if you get home from work at night and you only have X number of calories left and you ate your your salad for dinner and you, you really want something sweet, okay, go eat as much fruit as you're hungry for. I think mm-hmm. that that's fine. But all in is different for me because it's I'm going to eat, I'm going to follow my hunger cues and eat whatever I want. So do I think getting home from work and saying, oh, you know, I really want this Domino's pizza and then eating a whole Domino's pizza is a good idea? No. I don't think that that's a good idea. And I don't think that that's metabolically helpful. And I really think that a lot of the problems that she developed was because of that. Um, and then yeah. the other thing is people say, well, she did the first month of, of whole foods and she still developed issues. But I mean, if you look at some of the whole foods she mentioned, it was beans and oats and, and, and it was only 75% whole foods. She said, so yeah. there's still, it still wasn't like all whole foods. That's true. But then the, the whole foods she was eating were like, very heavy, dense, starchy carbohydrates from grains and beans and nuts and things like that. And I, I think that, yeah, that if you eat a lot of that stuff, you are going to blow yourself up. But yeah. I don't think that that was because she was eating whole foods. I think it was because of the types of whole foods that she was eating. Now, do I think she'd be blo- all bloated and whatnot if she was eating a, a bunch of specific fruits and drinking different juices and things like that and eating a decent, uh, a nice steak with a decent amount of fat and things like that? No, I don't think she would have gotten bloated at all. And I think she could have easily increased her calories to 5,000 with that and not had an issue and not develop swelling and, and uh, needed vein ablations and things like that. So I think that there's the nuance in there. I don't think that my point is, is I think if you do the intuitive eating the right way and you reverse diet in the sense of you're increasing calories instead of dropping them down the right way and you do it in the right way from my definition would be to increase slowly over time at a, at a, some sort of arbitrary standard rate, 200 calories a week, whatever you determine fix for you or whatever the, the specific research on reverse dieting discusses uh, that they found work, whatever protocol you can find that, that works for you. We'll give, we, we'll, we'll give recommendations at the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then from there, just, you know, work within the specific context of foods. If, and for us, we've talked about what foods we think from our principles work the best. So, do it. So yes, that, that's really my biggest gripe with what she did. That's my, that's why I think she had so many issues. And that's what I think is partly dangerous for people seeing this. Um, especially because a lot of people are coming from that place. A lot of, I would assume that most of the people watching her video are women who have struggled with weight problems, who have had some sort of eating disorder in the past, who have been competitors, who have dealt with any of these number of issues, who are amenorrheic or this or that, and then saying, oh, if I eat whatever I want up to my appetite and hunger, then I'm going to solve my problem and eventually my weight will come back down. I think that is a very dangerous perspective. And if it's taken that way, I think that that is a very dangerous perspective. Or at the very, at the very least, it's just not the best way to go about it. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is because there's people who, there's people on the internet who, on forums who have discussed trying this approach Mm -hmm. and saying, I gained a bunch of weight and it just hasn't come off yet. I'm gaining weight, I'm gaining weight, I'm gaining, and even in the Ray Peak community, there's this idea that if I eat enough sugar and drink enough milk, I'm going to gain weight to start because I'm in my healing phase and then it's going to go away. And then they balloon up to X number of pounds and reach obesity. And then they're like, oh, it's not going away now. And now, oh, so Ray Peak's principles must be wrong. 
And it's like, I don't think that, I, I really don't think that that's, <laughs> that's how it works. I don't think you just eat as much sugar and as much orange juice and milk as what you, what you want. And you're going to go through a healing phase and then the weight's going to come back off. Right. I also think it's important to point out that Stephanie's context here. She was a physique competitor who basically starved herself into the shape that she was in and then maintained starvation mode leanness for a woman for an extended number of years. So she was in essentially starvation mode for an extended number of years. As when you look at essential amounts of body fat that you're supposed to have as a woman, mm -hmm. um, she was probably way at the low end, especially if you see her early pictures. Oh yeah. She looked, yeah. She looked very, very lean, very almost borderline on starvation to some of, to some of the pictures, at least in my opinion. And that's not a knock against her personally. It's just, she was very lean. She was at an extremely lean state. She had died down to a ridiculous level. And so her context is different than somebody who just says, hey, who has amenorrhea because they're working out too hard in the gym. And I don't think going all in is going to just solve that problem magically. And you need to go. And part of the thing that they talk about is, well, you have to do this for a year. You have to do this for three years. You have to do this for four years. I don't think that for a lot of people, that's going to be good. Oh, you just eat as much as you want for four years. And then eventually whatever you want, however much you want for four years. And then eventually you're going to, your weight's going to stabilize. Your period's going to come back. Your thyroid function is going to be perfect. Right. I don't think that that's, that's a reliable statement. And I think that when you look and when you look at certain cultures, like with some of Weston A. Price's work, where they went from their traditional diets of whole foods to industrialized diets, they developed health issues. I think that that's important to look at as well. And I think right. that is part and parcel of what we're trying to say here and a good example of why it's important what you eat. As much as you have, you have intuitive cues, you follow those cues, but it's important what you eat. And then the, the next point to that, and then, then you got it, is that when you're eating the right types of foods and you're eating enough of them, you don't get that extreme hunger. You don't get those extreme cravings for sugar or extreme right. cravings for salt. And I think you, that the, the goal is to get to the point where you don't have these extreme cravings. And so you need to figure out within a certain range of principles what that works for you for us we've we've laid this out before in previous podcasts so yeah yeah and and no i definitely agree there's one clarification i want to make and then i want to well i want to talk about that physiology of hunger and the weight side of things and why it matters what we eat at least briefly with an overview so the first was just about the intuitive eating idea versus all in and you were kind of just saying that you feel like intuitive eating isn't is a good idea but all in isn't because with all in you're eating as much as you want and i i think that within again this Not is as much as you want it's whatever you want whatever you want but that's so part of this is semantic but within intuitive eating it seems like it is basically the same thing that you're just eating whatever you want based on your hunger and cravings however much you want it's just not as intentional as all in is i guess uh where it's like a specific period where you're planning and gaining weight all those things it, it seems like it's it's kind of more more broad or general or vague. But I think what we would both say is that within what we're going to talk about, because it has to do with how our hunger signals work and everything, is that while we don't think intuitive eating or all in are the answer, we do think that it is important to eat intuitively. And not only not only important, but but in line with our physiology and more or less ideal. Again, considering certain principles of what we have available in our food supply and things like that. So as far as the physiology side goes, I think it's first important to talk about like what drives hunger because that's such a huge component of the all in and intuitive eating. And as you were saying earlier, people who are overweight or even who are eating a lot are not just gluttonous. It's not just that they're lazy because the idea there is that regardless of what happens, we're always going to have hunger signals. They're always going to be there. And so the only solution is to either restrict or be fat. And it comes down to either willpower versus laziness. And that's not the case. Instead, there are, there are actual specific things that drive our hunger signals and that turn them off. And the most important one is energy. So if we have enough energy, in, and this is specifically in our liver and our brain, those are kind of the two certain parts of our brain, the hippocampus. These are like the two uh, sensors of the energy we have available. And if we have enough energy in those places, it allows for our hunger signals to turn off. And if we don't, then even if certain parts of our body are trying to turn off hunger signals, that often won't happen and we'll stay hungry even if we're full, even if we're gaining a lot of weight, 
and it's important to mention that they are supposed to happen be, because if we don't have enough energy, it means that something's wrong in our environment and we need to make sure we're storing body fat so that we can survive. So the that's such a huge component that's missed within intuitive eating and the all in idea is this this idea of of energy and separating energy from calories because when it just comes down to calories then it doesn't matter what you're eating all that matters is how much you eat and eventually you'll be a little less hungry and you're you're going to be at your quote unquote natural set point which is just much heavier than where you are and in reality that doesn't need to be the case because if we're eating the right foods and doing the right things that help to improve the efficiency of energy production, if we're really good at converting the food that we take in to energy, then our hunger signals turn off when we have enough energy, when we're when we're satisfied as far as nutrients and substrate are concerned physiologically, and we don't overeat. So that that's kind of why we say that it is helpful to eat intuitively when we're doing the things that allow us to convert food to energy properly. If there are, there are a lot of factors that block that process. So you mentioned polyunsaturated fats or PUFA, which are found in vegetable oils and nuts and seeds and fatty fish like salmon, which of course we're told is healthy. Those fats are really good at blocking energy production as an example. So if we're eating, even if we're eating quote unquote enough food, that efficiency is going to be reduced if we're eating a lot of polyunsaturated fats. So our hunger signal signals aren't going to stop because we're not going to be getting enough energy from the food and we're, then we're going to quote unquote overeat and then gain body fat. So in addition to polyunsaturated fats, there are other examples as well, which as you said, this is what we talk about throughout the, in, throughout the entire podcast is these things that block our ability to produce energy and the things that support it and what we can do, do about it. So another really important one is gut toxins. And you talked about digestion and how when our metabolism is low when we're not eating enough food our digestion is down regulated we don't produce the same amount of digestive enzymes and bile and our intestines don't uh, move through move food through them the same way and so we end up with a lot of uh, bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth that produce all these toxins that then will also directly block our ability to produce energy from food so when we have all of these factors blocking our convert the conversion from fuel to energy what we end up with is taking in a lot of food because we're always hungry and converting a lot of that food to fat and much less of it to energy than, than we could be. And so as we're going to talk about now, the solution is to adjust our diet and these inputs so that we are converting food to energy properly. And then at that point, we can increase slowly the amount of food that we're eating to get to a point where we aren't constantly hungry, any, hungry anymore with ideally much less body fat gained. And also resolving all of these other symptoms, which as you kind of alluded to, it's questionable whether Stephanie did resolve a lot of those symptoms. So especially because she went on birth control, which knocked out her ability to determine half of whether or not she just solved those symptoms or not. Right. And we don't know anything about her thyroid hormones because I, I don't think that she tested those if I remember correctly. Well, um, she did test cholesterol and her cholesterol didn't increase, which is an indicator of thyroid function. It can be, it doesn't mean indirectly. And, yeah. Yeah. And also considering the amount that she ate, it's probably assumptive that her thyroid is still, her thyroid activity is probably still increased compared to where it was before, but that doesn't mean that it's still ideal. So optimal. Yeah. And then yeah. you did get rid of her hunger. So she did and I think that. coldness too. And yeah. But, but yeah, so, so, and the important part to consider again, from the physiology side, as far as why we want to increase the food that we're taking in slowly it's because when we're in a starvation state, there are all these signals circling our bodies telling them that we need to be storing food as fat. Don't produce energy from food, store it as fat. So we talked about the polyunsaturated fats doing that. We talked about toxins from the gut like endotoxin or lipo lipopolysaccharide doing that. But another one is our stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, glucagon. And, and all of those, the more that they circulate, and there's others too, like estrogen, serotonin, things the more like they that. they circulate chronically. Right. The chronically, yeah, as they're chronically elevated, those also block energy production. So that's the main reason why, even if we're eating perfect diet, let's say, we still don't want to go from 1,000 calories to 5,000 calories because it takes time to lower those chronically high stress hormones, which block that conversion from food to energy and would lead to storing it as fat. And it takes time to upregulate the hormones that help to increase the efficiency of converting food to fat. So thyroid hormones are ones that we mentioned, and then reproductive hormones. So the androgens for men. And then, and, and as well as like pregnenolone, and then for women, mostly progesterone, and and again the 
the other steroids, pregnenolone is, is another main one. So it takes time to upregulate the things that govern our metabolism. And it takes time to downregulate the things that slow it down. And so because of that, if we just jump into 5,000 calories a day, we haven't given our metabolism time to catch up. We haven't given our hormonal state or our hormones time to catch up. Or our digestion. Or our digestion. That's another huge component. Yeah. Um, which is dependent in many ways on metabolism, on thyroid hormones and on on those um, quote unquote reproductive hormones, which are really just very general hormones. So I, basically, I would say that this is why it's important. The speed with which we increase how much we're eating or or yeah, like how much. You don't have to get to 5,000 in one day. Really, you don't even have to ever get to 5,000 depending yeah, on your you circumstances. Three, four, but whatever it is that you need to get to over the course of a few months. And it's, I don't think that it's going to make or break the situation in terms of you getting better. I think it may actually aid the process right. by not slamming that food right away. And we, I'm pretty sure we, just from our own personal experience, slamming food right away wasn't necessarily the ideal way to, to solve the problem. We did develop issues from doing that. Um, also, the types of foods we were eating was an issue, but still. Right. And then the other thing I want to talk about is, so we are talking about intuitive eating. Um, or eating intuitively do, or eating intuitively. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's just yeah. semantics. So that's why I'm like intuitive eating is like almost the same as all in. So I don't know. I think it's, I just think it's important though, for people to realize that it's kind of hard to parse out what your actual craving for something is sometimes. So when you get that chocolate chip cookie from subway, the reason you're craving that chocolate chip cookie from subway is probably because you want something that has a decent amount of carbohydrates and fats and some salt and things like that, which are all general cravings that we're going to have because the fat, salt, and sugar basically tone down some of the stress hormones and have direct physiologic benefits. Now, the cookie itself is created to have all of those components with flavor additives and enhancers and then a whole bunch of other products in them that, that when eaten, Set, tells your body, okay, these cravings are met based on taste, but then it causes a bunch of digestive issues. And then it can be fermented by bacteria. Some of the products are irritating to the intestine. And then that essentially will lower the energy process, energy metabolism and cause issues down the line, especially if the cookies baked with canola oil and whatever else. And the same thing goes for pizza and other junk foods and chips and whatever other crap that we have concocted now. And a lot of those things, people say, oh, I'm craving chips. I'm craving pizza. I'm craving this. The hyper palate, the foods are constructed now to be hyper palatable and they're meant to meet all those craving factors. There's meant to meet the carbohydrate, the fat and the salt component, which are the main things that we have cravings for. Um, and so they're constructed that way, but they have a lot of additives and they lack a lot of specific things like vitamins, minerals and polyphenols and things like that, that aid in our digestive process, inhibit bacterial growth and things all along those lines. So it's really important to say, oh, and this is why I think part of the whole all in approach is questionable. Oh, I'm craving, I'm craving all these donuts. Like, are you actually craving donuts? Are you craving a dense source of carbs and fat with some, right. with some salt and things like that? And that's why it's like, well, I was craving this, so it must be good for me. It's like, no, not really. I don't think that Pete, the most Domino's pizza and your store-bought cookies and all the ice cream with all the gums and additives and things like that is ever going to be good for you or help you get to a healthy state. I don't think the industrial foods are ever going to be good. That, and that's part of my problem. That's, that's an extension of the problem I have with the all-in approach. And why I think that it's more of a question of you have the, the craving for this, having some salt or having some fat or having some carbs. And to source those from different foods and industrial foods is what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I definitely agree. And so let's, let's talk through some of the more specific recommendations as far as how quick to increase calories, what types of foods people should be tending towards and which ones to avoid. And of course we'll reference a lot of the previous episodes because we talk through all of that all the time. I would, I would as, add as a caveat also that our cravings are like, we do have specific cravings for carbs and fats and salt and various nutrients and things based on our needs. Our bodies are capable of eating intuitively. That's how they're designed. But as you're saying, they weren't necessarily designed to deal with pizza and donuts. And the reason for that is not just because they're processed or because they taste good and they have carbs and fats and salt together, 
The problem is that they have components in them, namely polyunsaturated fats, and as you you know, some other additives and things. Industrial and, food additives and pure granulated sugar without minerals or vitamins or things like that, and added right. extra iron, whatever it is. Yeah, and and other things that disrupt digestion, as you said. So they introduce factors that Im- that impede our ability to digest them or convert them to energy, which is the problem. It's not the problem is not that we created them per se or that we put them together in this, this special way and that makes it bad. It's just that there are certain components there that will end up disrupting our hunger signals. And because they aren't leading to the right energy production that our bodies were expecting when they were telling you that they needed some carbs or some fat. So, so as far as that goes, as far as the, I guess let's start with the kind of what foods to eat. It is helpful. Like, of course, I don't even want to say like stick to whole foods because it, it's, it's besides there's, the, a, there's a wide variety of, whole foods and it's right, not just, it's not whole foods that solve the issue per se yeah there's exactly. specific types of whole foods right so the i would say some of the main things to consider are avoiding the polyunsaturated fats which are really good at blocking your ability to produce energy again those are found in vegetable oils nuts and seeds and uh which the vegetable oils are in all sorts of processed foods like packaged things and mayo and all sorts of like sauces and things and uh, also, again, fatty fish and fish oil, which we've done an episode on polyunsaturated fats and PUFA and why they're a problem. But avoiding those is, is definitely pretty helpful. Avoiding things that are really hard to digest. So this does include some whole foods like whole grains and beans and legumes. And again, we've talked about this in other episodes. I'll, I'll refer to those. But uh, avoiding those foods because they will lead to toxin production from the gut, like endotoxin or or various other toxins that will... Or they uh, themselves will irritate. Right, and will disrupt our ability to produce energy and lead to body fat, and and there's a lot of uh, there's research suggesting that endotoxemia, which is just high higher levels of endotoxin, is implicated in obesity. So, among other issues for sure. So, eating avoiding hard to digest foods, whole foods like whole grains and uh, beans and legumes, and lots of raw vegetables, especially with a lot of fibers and and raw starches, those are all going to most likely lead to various gut issues, especially if your gut is not already healthy and you're not already able to digest foods well. So those would be two of the most important things. Some other really important things are making sure you're getting enough carbohydrates, which are really good for keeping stress hormones down and increasing thyroid hormone and reproductive hormones. Getting enough saturated and monounsaturated fats are also helpful for both of those things. As far as sources for carbohydrates, just real quick, like whole fruits and fruit juice, dried fruits, frozen fruits are all really great options. And then root vegetables, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, other starchy vegetables like squashes. Those are all good options too. And again, rice. yeah, white rice as opposed to like brown rice, which the brown rice is much harder to digest, more likely to lead to gut issues. Some other important, oh, and then like protein sources, again, high nutrient dense protein sources and good fat sources. So fat ones like coconut oil, butter, uh, beef tallow, and fats from dairy. And then on the protein side, high nutrient density seafood uh, that's low in the polyunsaturated fats and um, good quality ruminant animal meat, um, staying sticking to like leaner chicken and pork because the fattier chicken and pork is high in polyunsaturated fats. Make sure it's pasture raised stuff. Ideally, yeah. You can. Yeah. And um, dairy, yeah. if you tolerate it, right? Dairy, if, if you tolerate it, I would say that that's like broadest overview of of the types of foods that are helpful for supporting energy production and the ones to avoid that inhibit it. The other thing that I would talk about, as far as again and again, as a general rule, experimentation is really helpful. Starting slow, testing out different foods, and that's another reason why we want to make sure we're increasing slowly as opposed to jumping in all at once. We're going all in. <laughs> and the and, and again i would highly recommend checking out those other podcasts where where we talk about those things yeah. the other thing i would say as far as going slow goes is as far as you know it is helpful to increase calories like increase the amount of food that you're eating especially if you've been in any sort of deficit for extended periods of times if you're dieting or restricting or you come from a history of yo-yo dieting or low carb diets then all of those things in the long term are going to come at the same cost as 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 any sort of starvation type diet. And that includes all sorts of hormonal dysregulation and all those symptoms we mentioned earlier. 
And so it is helpful to increase the amount that we're eating. I would say a good rule of thumb, maybe you could say like 100 to 200 calories every week or two, maybe like 5% to 10% of your calories every every couple of weeks. Um, again, there's no steadfast rule there. The whole idea would be just to start small and see how it affects you. Sometimes you might end up with increased hunger at first because you have a lowering of stress hormones. But again, slow and steady is going to allow for the easiest, uh, like it's it makes it easiest to correct what's what you've done wrong if you if you're finding that you're starting to come up with various symptoms and it also gives your metabolism the most time to adapt and to uh, regulate and and to increase the pro-metabolic hormones and decrease the stress hormones and as far as weight gain goes i will say that there some amount of weight gain may occur especially from water weight or just having more food weight because food itself weighs more so those are things to consider especially in the beginning and especially if you are going faster than the one to 200 calories, which we did. And, and there's something to be said for sometimes faster is better, but there's just more room for error. So I just want to be careful. Um, so some amount of weight gain from water and food weight is normal. But as far as body fat gain, again, a small amount is maybe okay, especially if it's not being packed on. You're extremely lean. If you're at like right. four, five, six, seven, eight percent body fat and you go up to 10 percent, 12 percent. OK, whatever. But right. gaining an entire an entire twenty percent or ridiculous amount of excess body fat, I don't think is a good idea in the long run. I don't know how the specifics of how much Stephanie gained, so this is not in reference to Stephanie. But the point is that if you're gaining a large amount of body fat rapidly, I don't think that that then something's going on. It shouldn't. Exactly. You can gain some water weight. You should fill out a little bit. You should be able to put on some some muscle, some body fat, things like that, a decent amount. You know, within a healthy range. But if you're hitting like 40% body fat, 30% body fat and things like that, then it's really time to consider, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And again, some amount of that weight gain is, is okay and normal and, and can just take a period Probably for adjustment. Huh? Yeah. And, and it might Probably be necessary. necessary. Yeah. Probably necessary. Right. But if it's excessive, then that is a suggestion that there's that, that the process of converting food to energy, energy production process is being inhibited in some way in an excessive way and that that's an issue or, or something that should likely be addressed. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So before we wrap up this episode, we were kind of jumping around a bit and we ended up uh, being a little bit short on time towards the end there. So I wanted to go ahead and summarize our thoughts, our overall thoughts on, on going all in and intuitive eating. And then also I wanted to talk a little bit about how much we should be eating and how we can determine that. So as far as all in and intuitive eating are concerned, we do think that these that these practices work as far as raising our metabolism. They do do the opposite of what chronic dieting does, which reduces our metabolism. They do lead to this increase in metabolism, but they miss a really huge component in doing so. So within these paradigms of all in and intuitive eating, the thought process is really that the amount of food that we eat is what determines our metabolic rate and that we've been dieting for so long we've been eating so little for so long so as long as we're eating more that's going to lead to an increase in our metabolism and eventually our appetite will decrease and, and we'll lose some weight and find that kind of happy medium place but in that thought process the idea that the types of food matter is really not even acknowledged it's, it's kind of thrown out the window and so that's where we see the biggest issue where in reality, the type of food makes the types of foods that we're eating make a huge difference on raising or lowering our metabolism. And when we're eating a, a large amount of foods that we don't use well, either we don't digest them well, or they don't have the nutrients that we need to actually process them properly and convert them to energy, then it leads to a lot of unnecessary weight gain and can lead to a lot of other symptoms. So because of that, we do think that eating intuitively is helpful, but as long as we're doing that within these certain food groups, which we did kind of lay out towards the end of the episode, but as, so as long as we're eating within those certain food groups, we can eat intuitively and we can say, we can try to tune into our cravings and notice that if we do have a craving for carbohydrates, then we eat some form of carbohydrates. But instead of that being French fries, it might be fruit. And again, that doesn't mean we should never be eating French fries, but just understanding the fact that while we, while our cravings might be for something like carbohydrates, 
just because there are carbohydrates in french fries doesn't mean that we can use them properly and instead in the case of french fries because of all the polyunsaturated fat, fats in there it's actually going to slow our metabolism down a little bit and lead to more weight gain so so we do think that intuitive eating makes a lot of sense just as long as we're considering the types of foods as well and then the other component is this idea of going all in versus going in slowly and as far as all in goes Again, this doesn't really give our metabolism enough time to catch up. So if we are eating the right types of foods, then this would lead to much less weight gain and much fewer other symptoms. But if we're just eating anything and everything and going all in, we're much more likely to have all of these extra issues that aren't necessary, whereas we could slowly increase the amount of food that we're eating and make sure that we're eating the right types of foods that support us metabolically and then we don't need to have that same unnecessary weight gain and those other symptoms so that's kind of the general that's kind of our general thoughts on going all in and intuitive eating where again the better approach would be to go slowly and to make sure that we're eating the foods that support us metabolically and if you do want to know more about which foods those are which foods are ideal for us to eat uh, for our metabolism I would definitely recommend checking out earlier episodes of the podcast. And then you can also head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy and sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I'll walk you through some of those ideal foods as far as metabolism goes. And then also different things as far as lifestyle and stress are concerned that will help to raise our metabolism and make sure that we are producing as much energy as possible and you and not wasting energy, which will allow us to find freedom from all of those symptoms that people experience from chronic dieting, the weight gain, the lack of energy, the inability to, inability to sleep, the gut issues, whether that's bloating or constipation. The, we can find freedom from all of those different symptoms when we're doing the things that support us on that bioenergetic level. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was talking about how much we should be eating. So we talked throughout this episode about how where our cravings and hunger come from and how our hunger is dictated by the by our energy availability, again, in certain areas, specifically in our liver and then also in the hippocampus and our brain. And because of that, what that means is that if we are producing energy efficiently, then the main thing that we can use to determine how much to eat is our hunger. So instead of creating some sort of arbitrary guideline as far as how much food we should be eating, we can actually tune into our hunger and eat as much as we are hungry for until we're satisfied. Again, as long as we're eating the types of foods that will allow us to effectively produce energy and will create the most efficient uh, metabolism, the inefficient energy production process. So the main determinant as far as how much we want to be eating should be our hunger. But Beyond that, there are some other guidelines that might be helpful. Of course, many of the, the common guidelines out there as far as calories go, the general 2,000 calorie a day diet or maybe 2,500 that's recommended for people who are more active is, is pretty arbitrary and it's probably helpful if we just throw those calorie guidelines out the window and kind of forget about them. And instead, again, work on typically increasing the amount of food that we're eating, but ideally not having a very minimal amount of weight gain, if, if any, because we are making sure that we're eating the right types of foods. So, so one other thing that we didn't really have a chance to talk about throughout this episode was the different macronutrients, carbs, fats, and proteins, as far as the different percentages there or, or how much of each of them we should be getting. And I'll link to an episode where we talked through exactly that uh, a, a previous podcast episode, I'll link to that episode in the show notes, as well as a few episodes talking about weight loss and more specifically why we don't want to be eating less and exercising more to lose weight and how this does lead to all those chronic dieting issues. It does lead to weight loss, but at, at a huge cost. And that cost is our metabolism and that cost is our health. So I'll link to those episodes in the show notes so you can take a look at those. And with that, let's wrap up this episode. If you did enjoy it, please leave a review or a like or comment wherever you're listening. It really does a lot to help support the show 
And if you could also leave a five-star rating on iTunes, I would really appreciate it. To check out those show notes, you can head over, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. And again, if you are struggling with any of those symptoms that I had mentioned earlier from chronic dieting or yo-yo dieting or low-carb diets or whatever it is, whether that is fatigue or brain fog or inability to sleep or your gut is not functioning well, or you just know that you could be feeling better, or maybe you're dealing with some more uh, significant chronic health conditions, maybe autoimmune conditions or diabetes or heart disease, I would definitely recommend you head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy and sign up for that free energy balance mini course where I'll walk you through the main things you'll want to do as far as nutrition and lifestyle are, are concerned in order to optimize your energy producing pathways and make sure that your body has the energy that it needs to function properly. And I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode and I will see you in the next one.